Here's another video to help you get ready for the 3.4 to 3.6 quiz in calculus. What I want to start with is reviewing the second derivative test. Some of the other videos talk about the second derivative as far as how you use it with concavity. But what I really wanted to have were a couple questions where you're forced to use the second derivative test. Second derivative test, just to remind you, is a test that you can use to determine where you have minimums and maximums without setting up intervals of increasing and decreasing. So it's kind of a, a second option, but there are times where you're forced to use it and that's what I'm starting with with these couple problems. So the first one you are given a second derivative and then in the written part it says that there are critical values of the function at x equals 1 and x equals 3, negative 3 and we want to determine if they're minimums or maximums. So here's a case where you can't do the first derivative test. The first derivative test was when you set up intervals using the critical values and you tested them in the first derivative and checked to see if it went from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. We can't do that here. Our only option is to use the second derivative test. So what the second derivative test says is if you take your critical value and put it into the second derivative, it's the result, positive or negative, that determines what type of extrema you have. So if you take 1 and you put it into the second derivative, so I'm putting it into this function, you would get 2 minus 1 plus 3, which gives you a positive number. It really does not matter what positive number, and I usually don't even write what positive number because I don't want to confuse that with the y-coordinate. All I know is that because it's a positive number, that means I have a minimum. So I would say that x equals 1 is a minimum, or you could write relative minimum of this function. Now you'll notice that's all I'm writing. I can't tell you the full coordinate because in order to get the y value, I always need an original function, which I don't have here. And then I'm going to do the same thing for negative 3. So I'm going to figure out what happens when I put negative 3 into the second derivative. When I do that, again, going back to the second derivative, I'm going to get 2 times 9, which is 18, minus minus 3, which is plus 3, plus 3 more. So I'm definitely getting a positive result. That tells me that this is also a minimum. So we have x equals negative 3 is another minimum. So here is a graph that actually had two minimums. I have no idea what the coordinates are of these minimums. I have no idea what the original function even looks like or what it's, how it's written. So this is all I can do is go through and use that. So that's one example of how you would be forced to use the second derivative test. In other situations, the second derivative test is maybe just a time saver where you don't have to determine increasing or decreasing so you can get the minimums and maximums a little bit faster. The next one is one that we actually did one like this in class. I think I had a little bit different, but it was a very similar setup where it's telling you about 2. It's telling you about x equals 2 and what happens when you put 2 into the function, into the derivative of the function, and into the second derivative. So here's what I know. f of 2 equals 6 just means that you have a point 2, 6 on the original graph f prime of 2 equals 0 is telling me that x equals 2 is a critical value because it's a value of x that makes the derivative 0. And then finally, this third line tells me that when I take that critical value and put it into the second derivative, I get a positive result. What that's telling me is that the point is actually a minimum of the original function. So again, all of these things are using the second derivative exclusively because we don't have any information to do anything else with the first derivative. So some examples all of how the second derivative test can be used in a situation where it's not an option but a necessity. And then the last slide that I want to go through is a review of 3.5. 3.5 was called uh, limits of infinity or n behavior limits. And it's looking at what happens when you take your limits as you go to infinity or negative infinity. So we're going to go through, talk about some of the guidelines we saw, some of the different cases and common mistakes. So the first one, we're looking at it. We have a rational function. You want to look at the degree. We have the same degree. They are both x over x. So my answer is going to be the leading coefficients. On the top, I have two x's. On the bottom, I have negative eight x's. I would like you to get in the habit of reducing, although that isn't something that's usually tested on the AP test. That tells me the limit is negative one fourth. If the question would have said, where's the horizontal asymptote, you would write y equals negative a fourth. I'm going to do the one below it now. I'm going to go down. Uh, the next one, what you'll notice is you have a radical. When you have a radical, you have a potential of two different limits and giving you two asymptotes. First, let's check the degree. They are the same. They are both x over x. The top, when you square a square root, you end up with x. We want the negative answer. So my answer is going to be negative. The other thing that's a really common mistake is you have to take the square root of 9, not 9 itself. So your answer for this one is negative 3 fifths. Common mistakes, forgetting the negative, not realizing it's going to negative infinity, and forgetting to take the square root of 9. The next one is a trig one, the sine of x over x. And we talked a little bit about this at, at the day after we did this section, 
with trig, and I'm only going to ever ask you about sine and cosine with these um, inf infinite limits, if sine is by itself, it doesn't have a limit because it continues to oscillate. It's periodic. But as soon as you take sine and divide it by an x, you will get an end behavior of 0, no matter whether you're going towards infinity or negative infinity. What will happen is this graph will flatten out at the ends. And that's true for any sine or any cosine over x, even if the angle is sine of 10x or sine of 5x. Going up to the top of the next column, we're again looking at our guidelines. This time we have a bigger degree on top. When you have a bigger degree on top, you will not have a horizontal asymptote. Your limit will be whatever you are approaching. In this case, we are approaching infinity. If it would ask you for horizontal asymptotes, you would say none. The next one, again, looking at degree, this one has a bigger degree on the bottom. When you have a bigger degree on the bottom, you get zero. It doesn't matter whether you're approaching positive or negative infinity because there's no such thing as negative zero. And then finally, the last one, when you're looking at cosine, remember cosine and sine are similar in that when you look at their graphs, they never approach anything at the end. They don't flatten out. They continue indefinitely going up and down between 1 and negative 1. So your cosine, just like your sine, would be a does not exist because it does not approach a particular value. It continues to go up and down and have that periodic look. That gives you an example of what your quiz is going to look like. You will have a section like that. You do not need to show any work or any justification. They are single number or infinite answers, and that is it.